He is risen. Alleluia. Thank you for that, and welcome to our church. If you've come back after a long absence, welcome here. If you're visiting with us, thank you for allowing this hour to be a blessing in your lives, as it will be in ours. Adrian is here, a blessing always when you are here, Adrian. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just back from uh, a brief vacation, and the handle fell off my desk. And I'm wondering, is that a hint of some sort? Hmm, we'll see. Uh, not sure what that's about. Uh, next week, I'm here 12 years. Now, think about that. that. No, 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 that's not why. At 20, I'm going to ask for a round of applause, okay? <laughs> but how does time go so quickly? It, it's amazing to me. And, and I, a theme that plays in my head is when I was in third grade, each day was a year, and now each year is a day, and I don't get it. And maybe I'm not, I see some heads nodding, maybe I'm not the only one here. Well, so glad to be here with you. I was in California, which is, oh, it was tough. It, it, no, it really was. It was probably about 73 every day, blue skies, a light wind blowing. It's really hard to take. And so on uh, my car, it was 111 coming in today, and I'm just so glad to be back here. <laughs> Let's rise and worship. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today's psalm has two parts. The first is the plea of the psalmist to God, and the second is his announcement of God's promised salvation. We now use Psalm 85 as we confess our sins and hear God's forgiveness for Jesus' sake. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You withdrew all your wrath. Restore us again, O God of our salvation. Will you be angry with us forever? 
Will you not revive us again? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord. The steadfast love and faithfulness of our God are endless for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for all our sins. God declares us to be his own children and has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Be God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, you gave such faith to your prophets that they listened and boldly spoke what they heard you say to them. Grant.
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today is from the prophet Amos, from the seventh chapter. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said, Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. And our epistle reading is from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him whose works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord.
Our gospel message this evening is from the sixth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. Let's rise to receive it. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, Others said, and others said, but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee, for when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, She pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, And she said, And she came in immediately with haste to the king, and asked, saying, And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of the Lord. And now together we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, and for us men, and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Please be seated. Would anyone like a B? I'll put it on the communion rail for tomorrow's people. We'll see. Uh oh. Well, maybe I'll just hold on to him for a while. How do we measure the vastness of his world? You know, it's only been, what, uh, 240 years since we've been able to measure longitude of this earth. And, and so exact measurement that we sort of take for granted now, I mean, uh, the Hubble telescope is up there measuring things we could have never imagined before that. And uh, all kinds of electric, uh, electronic devices are in our hands, right? Uh, the golfers are now measuring the distance, right, with a, with a thing. Is that fair? Is that fair? You know the rules. It's, it's legal in certain tournaments according to USGA. <laughs> Golfer, you know. Pardon me while I unbe myself. Okay, there he is. Um, yeah. And uh, with lasers, even around the home, you know, you can measure the, and measure walls and like that. Uh, in a previous life, I was a painting and wall covering contractor, and that would have made life a whole lot easier to be able just to shine a light somewhere and know what the distance is. Yeah, things have really changed. So we measure the vastness of his world with, with stuff and things now, don't we? Now, you know, what about that? To that little person, the world looks vast right there in front of them. And, and it is, it's pretty good sized. That's Morrow Rock. It's probably eight or 10 miles from here to there. Yeah, the vastness of his world registers to us kind of according to our circumstances, doesn't it? How do we measure the vastness. How does God measure? Well, Amos, from our reading earlier, this is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I said, a plumb line. Uh, Amos was born in, in Tekoa, and he lived in the 8th century before Jesus came. Here is Jerusalem, here is Tekoa, um, Bethlehem, they're, they're all very close here, the scale of miles is very small. And you see how uh, the kingdom is divided in his time. Judah is the southern kingdom, Israel is the northern kingdom. And interestingly, uh, Amos, although he was born in the southern kingdom, God called him, 8th century B.C., God called him to prophesy to the king in the northern kingdom. It's kind of interesting. A plumb line in God's hand. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. God speaking. God never spoke through Amos specifically what was going to happen to the northern kingdom and who it was that was going to do away with Jeroboam. And of course, it was the Assyrians. And you know that from your studies in Scripture. And this plumb line, you see it in Scripture in a couple of places. And there are some other spots wherein uh, God speaks of, of specific distances. You read this in Ezekiel, for example, in, in measuring out the temple that he showed to Ezekiel. Uh, uh, the distances and measurements for God in the Old Testament were very important. And what was he measuring after all? You know, these people built stuff, didn't they? You think of all of the incredible constructions that went on in the ancient kingdoms, in Israel, the uh, Solomon's temple, uh, in Egypt, uh, all of that that they built. And you know, they didn't have anything much 
with which to build it. Now, they could strike a, a straight vertical line, right? At least down to the center of gravity in the world. That's about all they had. Pythagoras, and you remember him from your sophomore geometry class, right? Pythagoras lived 200 years after this, and he's the one that gave us the mathematics to figure out what a right angle is. They didn't even, weren't even able to figure a right angle, for heaven's sakes, and yet they built what they built. And so this symbol of the plumb line for God, and this, this notion of measuring his people was really ominous. Because this is God measuring out how his people are doing against what he had put in place. And so, how does God measure the righteousness of his people? And that's what he was doing with this plumb line. And that's what he's doing throughout the Old Testament as he talks about specific measurements and, and he wants his people, Israel, the, the entire nation, the divided kingdoms together, he wants them to understand that he has some absolutes and he has some measurements for us. And after all, they are those 10. Those 10 that are continually getting in the way of the good times of those of us who know what those 10 are, right? Well, that's how God measures. Those are the standards. And as he dropped that plumb line in front of Amos in that vision, he well recognized, God did, that his people had stepped away from those absolutes, had stepped away from the sort of worship that he required of them. Had, had stepped away from everything that he had given them through Moses and, and those times in the desert where some statutes were laid down. How do we measure our worth in his world? Well, sadly... We don't measure them much anymore as a society. Maybe you do, you're pretty holy. As a society, we measure our worth in this world by standards that he never would have imagined. Uh, you know, worldly wealth, for example. How big is your 401k? It's bigger today than it was some years ago, I'm sure of that. And that's one of the ways in which we measure ourselves against other people, right? Is our, our success, our financial success. How else do we measure ourselves, our worth in this world? Sadly, we, we measure our worth in this world through physical stuff. And, and we decide that, well, okay, if, if I've got a whole lot of friends, then I must have some worth in this world, right? Right? Uh, if I've got um, a pretty great car, <laughs> we were having dinner in Montecito just a couple of days ago, and two women drove up and got out of a two-door Bentley. Have you ever seen a two-door Bentley? And so I went on my phone to see what a two-door Bentley costs, and it costs eight times what my Hyundai costs. <laughs> they got out. And they looked around a little bit and got back in it and roared off, and I couldn't go with them. <laughs> and, and so I have to think, okay, perhaps there's some part of those two, both women, uh, both like us of a certain generation, perhaps they're measuring their worth in this world by the fact that they can come and go in a two-door Bentley. This world is asking us to redefine what makes sense for us. And this is just in the last year or two years, something like that, that, um, that we're being asked to look inside ourselves, particularly as, as white Americans, and we're being asked to come to the conclusion that you and I have caused a whole lot of damage to a whole lot of other people who are not of our color. And so suddenly the world around us wants us to, uh, to measure ourselves 
on some sort of measuring stick that God could never have imagined. And frankly, folks, I don't feel very responsible for a lot that has gone wrong for, for other people in this world. And these days, that's said to be a failing on my part. And so uh, I know that I'm not measuring up to what a changing world desires me to be. Now, we have to admit that among us here, we have had um, perhaps certain advantages, perhaps certain privileges that other people simply haven't had. I get that. And yet, I don't see the cause of other people's failure in you or in me. And the world wants me to define my worth in this world according to a measuring stick that I, I just don't understand at all. And so there's all of that. And we measure ourselves, sadly, uh, perhaps not according to some absolutes that God gave so long ago, but according to the changing mores of this world today, according to the physical stuff that we can uh, uh, obtain and, 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 to, and for which we have all worked, let's face it, and yet, here's the other one. I'm a good person. I'll go to heaven because why would God not want me there? Because I'm a good person. I love everybody. And so there's all of that. that it's just different, isn't it? And you know what? It's all this. <laughs> it's all baloney. It's all baloney. And I never liked bologna anyway, did you? Had to eat a certain amount of it, didn't we? But all of that is bologna because, because the measurement of our worth in this world was taken by somebody else a long time ago, and it looked like this. And this measurement taken of us was completely outside of us and actually had nothing to do with who we think we are and how we behave. It was done strictly out of God's love for you, for you and for me, failed people though we are, not measuring up according to the new standards, perhaps not measuring up even according to those 10 pesky commandments especially not measuring up to them. And so God measures us not according to our own uh, successes or activities or, or even according to our failures in the light of the Ten Commandments. But God measures our worth in this world through him who died on a cross that my failures in this world would not come between the God that loves and creates me and you and us. No, our failures, so long as we are people who recognize this as our very own personal Lord and Savior, our failures, our failures to be what the world wants us to be, our failures, even as we measure against the Ten Commandments, they just have, they have nothing because our righteousness is measured by Him. For that I give thanks on this day. And, and I, I worry some what will come next as as the world continues to change around us, what craziness will come next to which you and I will never hope to measure up? And so I take solace, I pray you do too, in the truth that the measuring that God does of us is done as we gather at his cross. In Jesus' name, amen.
In addition to those listed in our worship folder we include in prayers, Florella Denson is hospitalized at Del Webb following surgery. And we also pray for Larry Heeb, will, who will undergo surgery this coming Wednesday. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus for all people according to their needs. Preserve your church, Lord, for your name's sake in your righteousness and answering in your faithfulness. Since you have sent us forth into this world to testify to your word, let us find conviction and confidence in our confession that salvation is found in the forgiveness of sins through Christ Jesus alone. You, Lord, are king over all the earth. You bring ruin on wicked nations and their rulers and are no respecter of persons. Spare our nation and its leaders, O Lord. Let the conduct of our civil servants and of our people be wise, just, honorable, and in accord with your revealed will. For the sake of Christ, be merciful to those who oppose you, and remember that you desire all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Lord, emboldened by our adoption through Jesus Christ, we bring before you every need of body and soul. Lavish the riches of your grace upon all of those who are in any need. These and all things and whatever else you know that we need, Grandfather, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We rise as together we sing that family prayer that Jesus taught us. <clears throat> Go now with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.